And welcome back to your performance final review, part two. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, part two of the final review because we need to talk about some lab techniques. All of your DBQs in the past, or a majority of them, have had a lab that came before them that resulted in you collecting data and putting it in a data table and then asking you to cite that data table to support your argument in answering the question. So that means we need to talk about some of the lab things that we've done in case you get asked about them on your DBQ. For example, the first thing we always do before any lab is safety procedures. So one of the big things is we know that goggles have to be worn and we do this to protect our eyes from splashes. Now remember, it is only cool to be a pirate at Halloween. You do not want to wear an eye patch for the rest of your life. Okay, so another thing is to have our hair tied up. Okay, not only do we need to do this when we have Bunsen burners out, but to prevent them from getting chemicals on them, uh, if they were to drape across the counter or something, um, but also from catching on fire. Okay, you do not want the fire blanket to have to be used on you and you do not want a new haircut that you were not prepared for. Okay, we also have to wear closed toed shoes. Okay, closed toed shoes are worn to prevent, or well not really to prevent, but to protect your feet from spills because if you spill a chemical on the counter, then it's going to roll off the counter and onto the floor, and before it gets to the floor, it could hit your feet or it could splash up from the floor. So we have closed-toed shoes. Um, we also need to use aprons, okay? So aprons provide an extra layer between um, your skin and chemicals, and they also help you by protecting your clothes so that you don't get holes and things of that nature on them. We also wear long pants in lab. These long pants um, are going to protect our skin from spills because um, again it can splash when it hits the floor uh, from spilling and rolling off the counter. The next thing that we need to talk about is a few of the labs that we have done throughout the semester. Um, that are going to tie into the ionic covalent, you know, electrons, protons sort of thing that we were just referring to. So let's talk about the um, unknown liquid lab where you had to identify it. Um, what you didn't know at the time was you had an ionic compound, a salt, and you had a covalent compound, sugar and you had to determine the difference, but one of the ways we did it was through conductivity. And then we also had a, another lab where we were looking at the melting point. And we've also done a lab about density. Um, so density, you know, can um, be used to identify a compound, um, but you can also use melting point okay so with melting point all right we can put chem the way we're going to do it or the way we did it in class is you put the chemicals in a test tube okay so let's say that we have our test tube over here so i'm going to make it silver this is our test tube This test tube here. Sorry, I'm getting a little OCD. You need to make it nice and neat. I'm doing a terrible job of that, but whatever. This is our test tube. What we did was we put chemicals inside it. Okay, and what we waited to do was we waited for them to melt. But the way we melted them is we put that test tube in a beaker 
um, that I had, you know, the measurements on the side, and that beaker had water in it. We're gonna put our water in here. And this beaker with water in our test tube, okay, it was sitting on a hot plate. So let's draw a little hot plate here. Hot. Okay, and what happens is we use a thermometer to measure the temperature of the water. And as the temperature of the water changed, okay, so the temperature, that's the red stuff in the thermometer, okay, as the temperature of the water changed, the liquids, intermolecular forces, or excuse me, not the liquid, the chemical inside the test tube, its intermolecular forces started to break apart and melt from a solid to a liquid. So when you have a solid, turn into a liquid, the temperature is the melting point. And that was one lab that we did in class. And obviously that is the most beautiful picture you will ever see of it, um, but whatever. The um, next lab that we talked about is conductivity. Okay, so conductivity uses conductivity meters to measure things. Um, and the meter, I'll again try to draw as good of a picture as I can, looks like this, and it has a green light bulb, and it has a red light bulb at the top. And then you have the battery, our batteries are blue for some reason. You have the battery on here, so this is the battery. And the battery was connected to these metal prongs that came from the bottom of the temperature probe. So it was kind of like this. And what you did was you stuck the prongs inside a liquid, okay, when, when it was inside the liquid, the electrons could conduct electricity or not conduct electricity depending on what was dissolved in the water. So if you were given solid chemicals, you had to put them in water to dissolve, and you put the conductivity meter in there, and the key thing about that is the brighter the light bulb, the more conductive it was. And we know that things that are very highly conductive are ionic, and things that are not as conductive are going to be covalent. And then another thing that we talked about is the flame test lab. Okay, now I asked you to write about the flame test lab over five times in class. And many of you, even after five times and lots of feedback, could still not write about it. So I'm hoping that this will be the one that actually sticks. Okay, we know that the flame test lab is used to identify unknown liquids, or really just unknown chemicals, based on the color of light produced. Okay, now the reason why they produce different color lights is because if you have a different number of electrons, they create different patterns and different patterns means different colors of light. That's a pretty cool thing. And so what we did was we always use a Bunsen burner. And yes, I'm going to draw another picture. We would use a Bunsen burner, which kind of looks like this. And then it had the little 
tube coming out. Okay, got the little slits in this side. And you would have a blue flame. Hmm, dark, you would have a, a blue flame coming out. Okay, so we use Bunsen burners. And what you did was you took a Q-tip. So you used a Q-tip. And you got it wet. And then you would put the Q-tip in the flame. And the flame would give off a different color depending on what it was. And then you can compare that color to known colors based on chemicals. And you could identify what it was. Um, now, the key thing is understanding why the light moves. So let's do a basic atomic review. If you're looking at any box on the periodic table, um, especially something like, uh, let's just do sodium, for example. That was one of the ones we did in the lab. It's number 11. It has an average atomic mass of 22.9901, I believe. And this is what its little box looks like. We know that this number is the atomic number, um, which is also the number of protons. Okay. And then we know that this number is the average atomic mass, okay, of all the isotopes in the whole wide world. But if you round, to a whole number, you get the mass number. So in this case, our mass number is 23. And that number 23 is equal to my protons plus my neutrons. And in this case, I know that I have 11 protons. So that means my neutrons must be equal to 12. Okay. Now, the reason why this is important is because if you're looking on the periodic table, you see that row 1 has, well, first of all, all the rows on the periodic table are energy levels. And so if we have in the center of our nucleus, we have 11 protons and we have 12 neutrons. And there are energy levels around it that are, or that are where the electrons orbit. This is based on the uh, Bohr model created by Niels Bohr. Um, not our current model, but still a pretty useful one. And so the energy levels represent each row. So sodium is on row three of the periodic table, which means that it has three energy levels circling it. Now, the key thing about this is that we know in a neutral atom, so just a normal atom of sodium, the number of protons is going to equal the number of electrons if it is neutral, meaning they um, overall do not have a charge. And so this tells us that I'm going to have 11 electrons. But what I'm going to do is I'm only going to draw one, because that's the one I want us to focus on. So I'm going to draw this one electron. And see, what happens in this scenario is that the electron is going to jump from the lower ground state or its original energy level and it's going to jump to a higher energy level called the excited state. Now the reason why it does this is because during in order to make that jump it had to absorb energy or heat from the flame. Okay, but it is unstable in that excited state, and so the electron is going to fall back down. And when it falls back down, it releases light in different colors based on how much energy it releases. Um, a the more energy it has, the more likely it will be. Uh, closer to a purple color, the lower the amount of energy, the um, more it will be close to a red color because red light has a lower amount of energy than purple light. And so what this might say in words, if we were to write this all out, which every time I was asking you to write about 
the flame test lab or how electrons produce light, the pickle demo, the flame test lab, the DBQ, all of those things, what I was looking for you to say is that the electron absorbs energy in the form of heat, okay, from the flame and moves to a higher energy level called the excited state. It is unstable there, so it releases the extra energy as colored light to go back to the original energy level called the ground state. Okay, that was the key information that you needed to know. Um, so yeah, well, if you have any questions, I guess you can send me a message on Remind or leave a comment on the video, and I'll try to get back to you. But good luck on your performance final.